This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship on this Palm Sunday morning, 2020. We may be separated by physical distance, worshiping in our homes, but we're never alone. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ or from each other as members together of our Lord's mystical body, not even the pandemic like COVID-19. My name is Bonnie Taylor, and I'm thrilled to say that I'm your new pastor. I look forward to meeting each one of you face to face after the coronavirus has left our community. But until then, please stay home and stay safe. As you can see, I'm broadcasting this service not from the church sanctuary, but from my own home kitchen table so that I too can comply with the governor's stay at home order. By now, most of you should have received a letter introducing me and providing you with my phone number, address, and email. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me for any reason, even if it's just to chat and get to know each other a little bit. Know that I'm lifting each one of you up before the Lord daily in prayer and giving thanks for being part of two such wonderful congregations. I want to remind you that as you need the church, the church also needs you. So please don't forget to bring your tithes and offerings into the Lord's storehouse. Even though the building's closed, you can send your gifts to the church's address and they'll be deposited as usual. Thanks. And now let's turn our hearts and minds to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Like the people who greeted Jesus as he entered Jerusalem and then later pronounced crucify him, we're a fickle people who often deny Christ in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Remembering the events of Jesus last week helps us see ourselves as what we are, sinners in need of a savior. A savior, praise God, we have in Christ Jesus. So with that knowledge and honestly and hope, we silently confess our sins to you. Help us to remember, Lord, that you have gone before us. And so we look to you for compassion and forgiveness knowing you are willing and able to save. For Christ came not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So, when we're weak, make us strong. When hurt and resentful, make us forgiving. When defeated and discouraged, make us hopeful. Keep us from asking for mercy without giving it ourselves, from praying for your kingdom, but never working for it. During this Holy Week, deepen our faith by your matchless grace. Deepen the measure of our gratitude and Christian obedience. Move us who have so much to share with others who have so little. Uphold us when we summon our courage to speak out for the alien and stranger within our gates and for those long denied dignity and freedom. Guard and guide us through this holy week of meditation and remembrance. Guard and guide us through all our days until we come at last to that day when all our times and journeys will be gathered into your eternity and we shall be with you forever. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. Hear God's word. After he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, 
go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find tied there a colt that's never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down through from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Now some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave you within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me now for a prayer of illumination. Eternal God, whose word silences the shouts of the mighty, quiet within us every voice but yours. Speak to us through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may receive grace to show Christ's love in lives given to your service. Amen. There's a famous photograph of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the commander of Allied forces during World War II, meeting with US paratroopers in England on the eve of the Normandy invasion. Eisenhower is smiling as he greets them. The paratroopers, their faces blackened for the night drop, look strong, youthful, and confident. Unlike unknown to those soldiers, Army projections before the battle suggested that as many as 70% of those elite troops would be injured or killed in the coming hours. Historians tell us that after that meeting, Eisenhower wept. It's something of those tears we find in Jesus's eyes as he approaches Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. He wasn't crying for himself, for the horror that awaits him there. As he looks across the city, Rather, he cries for the people who are going to reject him and for the terrible fate to which their rejection now dooms them. Jesus mourns, if only you had recognized the things that make for peace. 40 years later, the great Jewish revolt will effectively end with the destruction of Jerusalem. 25,000 defenders, themselves torn apart by infighting, will face four Roman legions, numbering some 80,000 disciplined and well-trained soldiers. The siege itself will last five months, but in reality, Jerusalem's fate was sealed the moment that the legions arrived. Just as Jesus predicted in our text, the Roman general erected great ramps of earth against the innermost walls of the city. He built another wall, some five miles in diameter, around Jerusalem to cut it off and force her people into starvation. Most of the food had already been destroyed as a result of the terrible battles between the Jewish factions themselves before the Romans ever showed up. Conditions within the city's walls were a, nice, were a nightmare. When Jerusalem finally did fall, there was only a fraction of the population left who hadn't died due to starvation or battle. Of those who were found alive, 
All who had taken up arms against the Romans were put to death, along with the aged and the infirm. Those left who were over 17 years of age were sent as slave labor to the mines in Egypt or to fight in the various coliseums in the empire, their deaths serving as a form of entertainment. Those under 17 were enslaved and Jerusalem herself, along with her magnificent temple, was leveled. Like Eisenhower, 2,000 years later, Jesus wept for the atrocities these people were going to face. He wept for the awful loss of life, and he wept for both the guilty and the innocent. What's remarkable here, and what makes Jesus' tears altogether different from Eisenhower's, is that Jesus is weeping for the very people who are going to have him murdered. As he drew closer to that hilltop where he would soon be crucified, he wasn't thinking about how terrible these people are or how to get revenge or even how to escape his fate. He wasn't wishing for his heavenly father's righteous judgment to strike them down either. His thoughts, as always, weren't about himself at all. He was thinking of how sad, tragic really, that those people are going to miss their opportunity to choose life instead of death. If only you had recognized the things that made for peace. And Jesus wept at the thought of it. His tears reveal so much about the heart of God. They tell us how much God loves and cares for us, not just for us, but for all the people around us. Both the people who are like us, who sit in other church pews when their buildings are open, but also those who are very different from us, who can't understand how anyone would waste a perfectly good Sunday morning going to church. People who we connect with and understand, as well as those whose lives are so different from ours, we can't fathom how they get along in the world. Those living in prosperity and those who are homeless due to poverty, corrupt governments, or acts of nature. Christ tear, Christ's tears tell us just how much God loves all of humanity, how much God cares for every person on this planet. Clearly, this isn't a love that anyone can earn or merit. The tears streaking Jesus' face were shed for a fickle folk who will welcome him into Jerusalem at, as their triumphant king one minute and turn away from him with cries of crucifixion the next. This is a love that was already there, is always there. A love that draws its arms not just around friends, but encircles enemies as well. Christ is a love that reaches out to all and invites us to do the same. If only you'd known the things that make for peace. There's a wishful, haunting quality about those words, a sense of deep regret, of opportunities missed. If only I'd listen more. If only I'd spent more time with the kids. If only I'd finished that college degree. If only I'd taken my money out of the stock market sooner. If only. I can't help but wonder if we're among those who've somehow missed it. If we aren't among those who've got the things that make for peace all wrong, where does our culture tell us we're going to find peace? Think about all the messages that constantly bombard us. Think about what we strive for and all the things that fill our dreams. The need to prove ourselves, the need to get out, the need to get our own way, the need to be better than all the rest. What do all these hopes and dreams reveal about us? And what do they tell us about where we honestly think true peace is found? The people of Jerusalem would have told you that they already knew what makes for peace. They had the law. But as Jesus tried to tell them, real peace doesn't come from an eye for an eye. You aren't going to find it in conforming to some outward standard. It isn't about success and it isn't about proving your worth. And certainly, we'll never find it by insisting on our own way. The way to peace lies in a very different direction. 
It lies with Jesus and our willingness to surrender our lives to his love. And then, empowered by his compassion, to love others without condition, to forgive those who hurt us, to pray for those who persecute us. We find peace in Christ's call to service and the willingness to use our lives to make a difference for others. True peace lies in scripture's call to love the Lord with your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could be nicer people or have better morals. He went to the cross so that we might find the one true way to abundant life. If we're honest, we'd have to admit that those tears of Jesus strike us as pretty strange. Who in their right mind is going to cry for the very people who are going to put him or her to death? Only the Son of God, whose extraordinary compassion shows us another way. Only through him will we find the way to true peace. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you in a world that cries, peace, peace, but there is no peace apart from you. And so we ask that you would enable us to accompany you through this holy week, through your suffering and sacrifice for the world that cannot comprehend your kind of love. For we know that only with you will we find God's eternal peace. Make it so, we pray, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance towards you and grant you peace, now and forevermore. Amen.